Hello. Thank you to everyone for joining. Uh, Michael Del Castillo here, associate editor at um, Forbes. And uh, we are here speaking with um, three of our current members of the Forbes Blockchain 50 list. Uh, before we get started, I just wanted to take uh, a, a minute to talk about the criteria to be on the list, uh, because the criteria, I think, is what gives the list meat, uh, gives the list teeth, maybe I should say. Um, in, in order to qualify for the list, first of all, you have to be valued at a billion dollars or more or be generating a billion dollars or more in revenue. Um, and you have to be doing meaningful work in blockchain. Meaningful is a very subjective word, but we do our best to make that as objective as possible. Um, so to give just a quick idea, um, if you're a, a billion dollar company, um, uh, meaningful might be a team of five or 10 people. Um, if you're a $40 billion company, the barrier to entry is a lot higher. So the idea is to identify known companies usually um, or rising stars in the space that have recently crossed that billion dollar milestone um, and who are doing more than dabbling, right? And so I think that's what the idea of Meaningful is trying to get to, that, that these firms uh, have, have committed serious resources and if you're, if you're a billion dollar company or a $40 billion company, what serious resources means might be different. Um, and and our, our team of 12 to 15 uh, editors, depending on how you, you measure it, really gets down into the numbers. So we do, uh, uh, I guess you'd call it a request for proposal um, or a, a, a public questionnaire to nominees. Um, and we try and get as much data as possible. Um, once we narrow that list, uh, we hop on the phone with leaders at the companies, we ask questions, um, we try to understand what's behind the numbers, um, and we get together and we really duke it out. We have a team of, um, of, of people across the company um, that represent various expertises. So, for example, it's not just me on the blockchain side. We have a healthcare editor helping us parse through the healthcare data. Um, we have an energy editor helping us parse through the, the, the energy data. And the, the dream is that the 50 companies that come out the other side um, are sort of mile markers in the industry. Um, and I, industry might be a little bit too broad of a term uh, in, in, in that um, the, the underlying blockchain technology is so broadly app applicable. Um, and as Brian put, uh, as Brian uh, mentioned, uh, we do have some companies that are on there for uh, crypto applications. Uh, i.e. not enterprise blockchain. So occasionally a micro strategy or a Coinbase will also slip on there. Um, so with that said, uh, I just want to give a quick overview of kind of where we're going to go with our conversation today. Um, one of the fun challenges about leading a panel with completely different companies is sort of trying to find that through line. Um, and I think in, in, in order to do that, what I want to do is I want to start local, I want to start with a very specific use case um, that these companies are, are working on. Um, and we're going to kind of um, take st step up a notch that every, every question and get more and more high level, more and more abstract, and hopefully get to a place where uh, by the time we're, we're, we're wrapping things up, we're all kind of looking down from the same place at, at, at enterprise blockchain in general. Um, uh, specifically, though, uh, last thing before I let our esteemed panelists talk, um, I wanted to just quickly highlight something that Brian said in his opening remarks about Cactus Weaver and Yui, uh, three code bases that are ostensible competitors that um, sort of figured out how to work together and are in the process of figuring out how to work together. Importantly, across borders, you know, I think if you look behind the scenes, each of these code bases has different um, regional bases. Um, and it, it only makes sense that they would be working separately at the, at the start, but Hyperledger helps bring them together. Um, and so I want to focus on that. You know, if you look closely at the, the, um, of the event name, that's the global reach of the Forbes Blockchain 50. So um, we will be looking at how these different use cases are working with others, um, probably not how they're working with each other, um, but uh, we'll, we'll, we'll try and learn some lessons there. So to kick things off, um, I'd like to ask uh, Shue if you could please walk us through um, one of these two, either the biggest blockchain application that China Construction Bank has, or uh, the newest, most secret one that no one's ever heard of. 
Okay, thank you. Thank you, Michael. Uh, uh, everybody, uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. And uh, um, I'm glad to hear again, and the last year I'm, uh, uh, on behalf of CCB, attended the panel uh, first. And uh, this year is uh, happy again to be here. And uh, regarding to the application, which is uh, highlighted this year, I would like to the application of CCB trade finance. And uh, I remember that last year, I also uh, mentioned this. Uh, here, I would like to uh, update the latest progress of this uh, from below uh, three aspects. And the first one is about the ecosystem. In, uh, in the last year, in 2020, we successfully uh, connected to the, uh, to the other uh, major banks in China, uh, like of Bank of Communication, uh, Postal Saving Banks in China, and the Guangfa Bank. And also, we export our underneath blockchain-based um, e uh, system and the platform to the China uh, Banking Association. And this is a very uh, big progress because uh, it helped us to build a second big global bill market. And uh, the connection between these uh, this, this, uh, financial institutions is also based on the cross-chain model, cross-chain technology. And uh, the technology uh, helped to, um, uh, to, to improve the uh, efficiency, especially for the forfeiting uh, business. So till now, the newly uh, increased uh, uh, financial institutions institutes uh, about um, 38. And uh, the average transaction uh, volume uh, per year is about 500 billion RMB. And uh, the cumulative transaction volume uh, is, uh, has exceeded the, the 1,000 billion RMBs. So this is the first aspect I want to mention. The second is about the refactoring. So first is, a, uh, is ecosystem, second is a, uh, refactoring. And uh, uh, in the last year, on the basis of uh, existing uh, applications, we realized that the ecosystem's integration uh, with the uh, industry's leading platform, like China uh, Enterprise Cloud Chain. Uh, uh, this and, and the, it, it uh, helped us to reconstruct the product process and help to provide the, um, the better finance system, financial system for the SMEs. Uh, uh, so till now, our enterprise clients has exceeded 65,000 and the financial volume exceeds uh, 120 billion RMBs. So this is second part is about the latest progress of the trade finance. And the third one is about the blockchain-based um, um, blockchain based logistics finance platform. Uh, uh, in China, there is a city named Qingdao uh, in Shandong province. And uh, this last year, we launched a, a pilot in Qingdao branch, uh, Qingdao CCB Qingdao branch. Uh, and the five uh, current, uh, five, uh, local customers uh, uh, help us uh, collaborate with us together, and uh, we uh, successfully to deal with about five, uh, sorry, three hundred and fifty transactions totally, and uh, the cumulative cum cum cumulative uh, finance amount is about um, four hundred and twenty million RMBs. So at present, CCB has collaborated with uh, uh, large scale logistic uh, local enterprises and also the uh, third party um, supervision platforms. So this collaboration help us to uh, uh, solve the problem for different blockchain platforms integration and also the asset digitalization and this really help the, 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 the China SMEs, the small and the medium enterprise uh, to get the inclusive uh, finance services from CCB. Uh, yeah. Thank you so much for that, Sue. Um, and I wanted to thank you also for bringing those numbers. I had, I had asked that because uh, I, I, I've been around for a while, as, as Brian indicated, and I remember the first one of these, I don't think there were any numbers because <laughs> that, that thing had really launched. Um, and so I, 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 I love opportunities to kind of 
uh, bring that out and talk about the real stuff that's happening. Also, I think the scale of the work you guys are doing over there um, is, is notable. I just wanted to make sure we had a chance to talk about that. Um, moving on, um, Rajesh, could you walk us through um, the, the same thing? I'll give you the same question. Either uh, the biggest blockchain application that Tech Mahindra is working on or um, the most secret new one that nobody knows about. Your choice. How about uh, talking about both, uh, Michael? So okay. I would like to talk about the biggest and also spilling the beans, uh, the secret one. So I would like to talk about both. Uh, obviously, the biggest is the is the one that has been recognized uh, by your team in the Forbes 50 listing, which is primarily using uh, Hyperledger Fabric uh, protocol to insulate over 1 billion subscribers in India from the spam calls and the spam text. Just to uh, give a perspective of the numbers, there are about uh, 30, more than uh, 36 peers in this particular network. Wall's uh, first largest uh, multi-cloud implementation of uh, Hyperledger uh, Fabric, uh, the number of channels exceed about uh, 20. And at this point of time, this network is catering to 230 million preferences uh, of the subscribers. And it has about uh, 1.7 million consent and the rest 500 million, half a billion uh, consent is under migration. Uh, we expect uh, the transaction per second to be 200 and using a on-chain and off-chain combination, we expect it to go to about uh, 4,000 transactions per second. That is the scale of volume. And uh, thanks to the coverage, Michael, uh, this is being used as a de facto gold standard for implementation in different parts of the world. The latest is the uh, US government is also taking a look at that, a look at this particular implementation from a perspective of integrating a blockchain into the stir and shaken protocols that they have already announced. So that by far is the biggest ever application that uh, Tech Mahindra has architected. Now coming to the secret one. The secret one is the one where we would like to leverage again the size of the masses and the size of the scale that's where we want to bring non-fungible tokens to the exciting world of cricket uh, cricket is now being played in about uh, 11 countries the game is catching on and the number of people who are playing the game is only increasing day by day uh, given that we would like to create a non-fungible token platform for all the cricketing fans if the basketball fans are able to enjoy why not the cricket fans so we would like to take this particular uh, platform and the good thing is we are also looking at uh, integrating non-fungible tokens into the hyperledger platform we already have an another um, blockchain platform called blockchain powered contracts and rights management system which helps uh, the companies in media and entertainment space to manage their digital rights management facilitate track and uh, track and tracing and also to ensure that uh, proper geo blocking is there and that is the platform which enables that as a first step we are integrating nfts into that particular platform so that in addition to drm which will help a person to establish the rightful ownership of a digital asset whether it is a music file whether it is a video file or whether it's a picture file in addition in addition to that we would like them to further reiterate their ownership with an underlying non-fungible token that is what we are doing from a perspective of b2b First time ever NFTs will be brought into the purview of business to business transactions. The second logical extension of that is to take it to the world of cricket, wherein we would like to empower all the cricketing clubs, all the cricketing organizations in the world to monetize their cricketing assets with an ability to create a marketplace to mint tokens and sell those tokens. So these are the things that we are working on, Michael. I love that. I do think that um, you know, we're, we're looking for you know the evidence of, of traction. Um, certainly uh, blocked calls 
uh, is, is one that impacts uh, many of us personally. I'm excited to hear that uh, you're in conversations with the US government because we definitely need some help. <laughs> um, and I also, I love the fact, I remember in the early days there was, you know, um, at least in, in, in the media, there was uncertainty about whether or not um, uh, permissionless public block or permissionless uh, um, open blockchains um, and, and, and private blockchains could both do tokenization. And obviously we've gone way beyond that. And there's, there's, um, uh, per, there's um, per, permissioned blockchains doing tokenization across the board. It will be cool to see NFTs uh, wiggle their way into the hyperledger conversation. Um, and and uh, last but certainly not least, um, Jose Luis, uh, kind sir, if, if you could please walk us through, I'll give you the same question. Um, either the uh, the biggest, most high, the highest transaction volume uh, blockchain application at Telefonica, or the the most secret one that you want to unveil. Okay, thank you, Michael. First of all, I want to thank you for inviting Telefonica to join this panel about the global rates of blockchain because I think that all the companies that uh, are today working on on blockchain, we are thinking globally because uh, in the end we don't have any kind of restrictions about the hardware or licensing or whatever. We are just software solutions that can uh, solve a lot of challenges to a lot of companies around the world. So, okay, about the question, the biggest and the, and the secret. Uh, probably the, the biggest uh, use case that uh, we are still pushing inside Telefonica is how we are managing our uh, home equipment supply chain. So how we are delivering the routers and the set of boxes at all this kind of equipment from the warehouse, from the factories that we are assembling them until uh, up to the full chain, until that the, the installers connect to the network. So we started internally this project three years ago, three, four years ago. It's one of the first projects that we started to adopt uh, blockchain in, in Telefonica. And we are uh, currently managing all the equipment that is being delivered and installing in uh, our operation in Brazil. So all the operations are being managed by a blockchain, a private, private blockchain uh, and, uh, running on, on Hyperlayer Fabric Network with uh, more than 60 uh, warehouse, uh, internal warehouse, also subcontractors, subcontractors and all the work for, uh, workforce of installers that are going to our customer's home with the set of boxes and, and connected to the network. So the, the most challenging um, activities that uh, we are running right now is to push this, uh, this project, this, uh, this kind of initiative based on blockchain to all the operations around the world that uh, we have in, in Telefonica. So the next countries in which we are going to deploy the same solution is to manage operation in, in Spain, also in Europe and of course in the rest of, of Latin America. So this is the first project that we started in the past and it's, it's still the biggest one. I the love second, it. Yep, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Okay, so the, the before talking or speaking about the, the secret, it's the other approach that we have in, in Telefonica because we started to, to understand uh, what could be the use case that uh, we can adopt blockchain and obviously, a lot of papers, uh, the analysts uh, of the industry say that uh, we have to do things with other tech operators in order to be efficient or, or ma uh, efficiently manage the, the roaming and the telco services. So we are pushing that. And in the next weeks, we are going to announce this kind of collaboration with other telco, telco operators uh, and, and involving also the GSMA. Uh, with uh, uh, finally uh, success uh, cases of how we are managing our core services with blockchain, how we are making efficient, more efficient, the dispute resolution processes and the, the agreement, the discount agreements and these kind of things that we run in the past, a lot of proof concepts, but finally we have a kind of common uh, infrastructure in which we can develop real use cases based on, 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 this, on this case. And finally, the more circuit and the more massive uh, uh, approach that we have of, of how we can adopt blockchain is uh, how we can bring them to have a good proposition for our B2B customers. 
So we think, we really think that blockchain can help a lot of companies uh, in being more efficient or getting more uh, incomes in, in these times. So we, we, we get all the learnings that we have with this internal project of how we can benefit as Telefonica from our team to, to blockchain, for, from our team blockchain uh, and bring them to our customers. So we develop a kind of platform because our aim is how to make blockchain massive for any kind of company. So regardless the technological profile or the, the size of the company, we think that any company can get benefits from blockchain. And we are in, just in this way. So we are deploying the platform, uh, trying that any company, the small companies that can, can invest in having a blockchain team can use blockchain. And this is the, the main challenge that we have for the next month. Uh, and that's our own product that is TrustOS. Uh, could be this kind of layer that make a blockchain option totally massive for, for all, the, all the companies in our footprint. And you, you mentioned um, expanding into a couple different regions by name. Um, please correct me if I'm wrong, but I think um, each of your companies has in uh, their own way started with uh, their own regions um, and are working with banks or telephone providers, et cetera, that are closest to home and, and, and building up those networks um, within the borders of your, 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 your company's uh, home country, so to speak. Um, but then th that idea that once you set that up and once you get transaction volumes running through and once you prove that your technology works, that you want to start reaching beyond those borders, sort of the, the network effects of big networks and that the benefits grow exponentially. So um, from a strategy perspective, if you could each take just one or two minutes, feel free to riff off each other. If you hear something the other one says that reminds you of something you're working on and talk about how you took those first and second steps to go from your network at home to a bigger network with broader network effects that reached across borders. Did, did you have inbound requests? Did you make requests to other people? Um, was it working uh, in, in groups like Hyperledger or other open source groups? How, does, how do you go from step one at home to reaching a global audience? I kind of start. So uh, in our case, uh, for instance, we are working uh, in, in several consortia like Hyperledger with a global reach, but for instance, with Alastia, this is the Spanish consortium. And even in, in Alastia, we are having a lot of uh, uh, working or a lot of collaboration with other countries, with other initiatives that uh, all of them are or have a local approach. So uh, in Europe, we are uh, part of, of FC and, and we are working with the European uh, blockchain infrastructure in the next months. And it's again a pan or, or, or a transnational. Uh, initiative in which notarization services or, or financial even services could be cross-border because the own nature of, of, of blockchain networks, as, as you say. So we are expanding uh, step by step, but probably if we if the technology become massive, it's because we are uh, uh, reaching a lot of companies with uh, with global perspective too. So we are partnering with uh, several big companies that are not based also or only in Spain or in their own countries, they are multinational that are also expanding with us the reach of, of the networks. And can you, is, can you give an idea as you expand, is it the same kind of benefits just on a bigger scale or do you start to see different kinds of benefits as your networks get bigger? I think that if we talk about blockchain, we are talking about networks. And if we are talking about the, about the networks, the value of the blockchain is the value that all the network, all the members in the network are getting. So uh, it's the, 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 the traditional uh, concept of win-win. So it's, it's not all, only win-win, it's win-win-win-win with all the members that we are joining to the network. So it's- To, uh, to, it's to, to clarify that. just a little bit, maybe, for those, for those of us who aren't um, in the business, give me one example of how using a blockchain is more efficient, uh, more cost effective than the, the traditional centralized uh, accounting structure. 
I, I'm monopolizing the, the conversation, but <laughs> I can go ahead. So, for instance, in our success case of the supply chain in, in Brazil, uh, is something related with something that in the previous panel uh, you were talking about. This is about the analytics and how we can uh, put a lot of data in common from different sources of information. For instance, uh, we are we have monitor or we have some decisions in order to optimize how the different warehouses are working inside the warehouse. But putting all the information together in the same blockchain, we can optimize or or making decisions in one warehouse in order to affect or impact the full chain. So we are making decisions probably with information that came from the other warehouse and uh, uh, with uh, we are working with our blockchain, we don't have this visibility. We have to make point-to-point uh, -point integrations between different uh, information systems from different warehouse and we can optimize my warehouse with information on the full chain. So the main benefit of this kind of, of, of use case of, of being efficient, more efficient with, with operation, is this kind of exchanging of information and how we can make analytics to make this decision with a holistic perspective. So with that in mind, I'm turning back to uh, Shua and, and Rajesh. Um, how did you guys take those first steps from the, the early networks um, built around your, 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 your headquarters and the, the companies that you already knew um, into cross-border territory? Definitely, Michael. So in our case, uh, two things have uh, helped a lot. One is in terms of the regulatory push. As you know, the initiative of uh, blockchain for spam calls was initiated under the aegis of the Telecom Regulatory Authority of India. And because of that particular push, the telcos have got together. Otherwise, this problem would have remained unsolved with the traditional technologies. Mm. If the traditional technologies had the potential to solve, spam is not an invention of last one or two years. Spam is an invention over the last 10 years. This problem should have been solved about 10 years ago. The fact is, because blockchain came, this problem has been solved. So that's a very good example about the ability of blockchain. And more important, it's making it real for the common man on the street. And the regulator role there played, uh, played uh, I mean, it has accelerated the adoption. But with that, it brought what we call as the first mover advantage. Uh, the fact that it got implemented for the first time in India became a reference point elsewhere. For example, the regulator in United Arab Emirates have asked Etisalat and Do Telecom to replicate what India has done. And Etisalat and Do Telecom have done it because the, there was a regulatory push. But in markets like UK, spam is not that uh, prominent in mobile phones. Spam is prominent on landlines. So the Office of Communications in UK want to adopt this to prevent spam on the landlines where people just pick up the directory and dial the number and start selling services and goods and so on and so forth, right? And in the United States, FCC has, uh, has asked IETF to come up with these regulations. And IETF has taken a perspective saying, moment you see a robocall, or moment you see a text that originates from a Vivo IP channel, shut it down by using the cryptography and by using stir and shaken kind of protocols. There the focus is on shutting it down as and when it happens. The focus is not on elimination of the problem completely. The elimination can happen, as is the case it was evident in the Indian market, only when all the telcos come together and they agree to share the information and then take a industry-wide initiative to eliminate this malice, to eliminate this particular problem. So what I'm trying to tell you is uh, there is no one particular strategy that has worked for us. It is a combination of two or three things, the adoption and the regulatory push to drive the adoption by all the operating companies in the industry, which has led to a successful consortium effort. The second one is a pull and push kind of a thing in markets where regulators wanted to replicate it. 
they they used a push strategy in the markets where regulators were not forthcoming we went and presented these case uh, case studies leveraging uh, avenues like you know whether it is uh, forbes or whether it is a special interest group of telecom under hyperledger scheme of things or whether it is uh, special interest groups that are there with large tech providers like ibm microsoft and the others and the th and the third one is is the first mover advantage that's what we are trying to leverage in the world of cricket also with respect to uh, creating non fungible tokens once you create it for cricket it gets replicated in other sports areas as well something tells me that one's going to uh, spread uh, very organically um the going Absolutely. back though to the spam calls how how cross border is that you know i think many of us at least my my I'll speak on my own behalf i don't know where these spam calls come from are they coming from the office up the road from me are they coming from the other side of the world like is spam calls um a cross border problem um or is it usually confined within a phone network within a region so there are uh, there are two or three areas one is in terms of spam that originates from registered marketeers it is originating from registered marketeers because uh, they overlook uh, some of the provisions so from that perspective we would like to go back and tell them hey while you have a right to send information in this case you do not have the consent from the subscriber so you're violating uh, the preferences of a subscriber so you need to prevent doing that and we we give uh we give uh, documentary evidence for that and not only pertaining to one particular network but across the networks then comes the second scenario where spam is by unregistered telemarketers these guys are like nomads they go and set up what we call as a sim farm on uh, local telco networks and when the complaints start mounting on that particular telco network the telco takes an action and the telco shuts them down then they go to an another network set up the same sim farm and then they move from one network to an another network so this kind of an implementation prevents that cross pollination of the sim farms on different networks the third one is coming from cross border wherein they go and take subscriptions uh, through from the networks which do not which are not in india and 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 the spam is coming from cross borders and that to be very candid with you that is still not covered under the scope of implementation that we have currently it is because the implementation pertains only to all the telco operators in india but what these telco operators can do is whenever they see that kind of traffic coming through their telco gateway they can shut it down but the ability of these guys go and seek subscriptions in the cross border telco networks will always be there but the inbound messages and inbound calls when they go detected the participating telcos in india can shut it down really quick, is there through. is there one is there one number to give us an idea how bad was spamming in india before regulators had to force a change oh before the regulators i can give you the number and i can give you my personal experience the number is on an average really quick really quick every, yeah on an average every active subscriber gets about uh, uh, 15 to 20 spam messages and 15 to 20 calls in my case whenever i land uh, from uh, from the airport the first call i get is from a spammer and not from my family the yeah. spammer knows that i've arrived arrived and i have landed much faster than my by family member that's heartbreaking Shuei, uh, uh last but certainly not least um so I, i when when we had our chance to talk before this panel um you had mentioned that there were um a a couple uh, overseas um uh banks that you had recently started working with um if i if i took my notes down right i think you're you're currently working with 38 institutions on your trade finance application um have you expanded um into other territories and um if not walk me through kind of how how are you going about doing that uh okay uh the cross border uh, uh collaboration of the trade finance uh there the number has no big change and this is the ccb overseas branches and i would like to uh, echo and answer your question uh from maybe different uh, uh, angles uh you mentioned that the the maybe the network uh, expansion within the border or cross border uh as we know that we has uh the the blockchains has made me more than 
10 years of history. And in China, as we observed, there is the problem is not lack of a network, but uh, the, maybe there are so many small and uh, uh, medium network here. And we know that the, 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 uh, the di different industry, various industry has built or joined the existing blockchain ecosystem and uh, maybe according to their early needs. But uh, due to the early uh, technology adoption and uh, the lagging of the standards, uh, globally and uh, internationally and maybe local, the different blockchain system has different technology routes uh, and uh, especially with communication protocols, uh, identity uh, management and other, uh, other aspects. So I think this is also some uh, major, major challenges when we uh, expand our um, network. So we observed and we noticed that maybe the future main uh, three major challenges in technology uh, is the cross border, uh, sorry, cross chain, cross chain inter interoperation, and maybe the um, security and the pri privacy protection and the scalability. So, so, so I think. Uh, uh, from, from the uh, from the uh, globally from the internationally we also call for and welcome any inter uh, collaboration and uh, uh, collaboration across different parties to solve these three uh, major technical challenges yeah thank you so much for that it actually gives me a perfect segue into the last question um, which is an open one to everyone I'd like to ask you each to keep it to about a minute uh, or so so we can make sure everyone has a chance. Um, uh, and it's a, it's a one word question, which is how, right? But I'll, I'll, I'll do a little expansion on that. So um, our, our audience uh, is largely, I, I think, technologists. The, the, the Hyperledger team has got together um, builders around the world, writing software in multiple code bases written by countries all over the world. Um, and you're all doing absolutely fascinating work. Um, I, I loved uh, Rajesh's uh, example when um, when people weren't um, being proactive enough, he started going to them. Um, that's a pretty interesting example of, a, of an answer to the how. Um, but what about what about you guys? Um, if uh, members of the audience heard something that you talked about and their imaginations started clicking, and then maybe they have ideas about how their own software skills could um, help solve something that you guys are working on. What's the next step? Um, do, are, are, is there a, a, a GitHub code base they can go to and download something? Um, is there an API they can access on your website? Do they need to have their uh, marketing team reach out to your marketing team? Like what's the, what's the first step um, if a developer um, hears something that you guys are doing that they wanna get involved with in order to make that connection? Sure, Michael. Reaching out to uh, us is uh, definitely uh, the first step. And then in addition to that, uh, we have uh, our uh, blockchain uh, studio on the cloud called uh, Block Studio. We'll be more than happy to extend uh, the Block Studio to the interested developers. And at TechM, we have what is called as Makers Lab. We have around 12 Makers Labs in different parts of the world. They're welcome to come and then explore our Makers Lab, and we will give them an opportunity to incubate their offerings within our Makers Lab. All three options are available from us to them. Thank you, Rajesh. Shue? Uh, for the collaboration, for the for the collaborate cross-border collaboration and from the technical perspective, uh, our attitude is still the same. We are still open. We are always open and we welcome and call for the global technical uh, partners, experts to, to, call, uh, to collect, uh, connect with us, contact with us. So maybe here after the panel, I would like to give you the, the connection, uh, contact information. And uh, this is the one, uh, maybe uh, uh, one way. The other way is that the CCB has uh, local uh, branches in different countries. So if there have any uh, big progress or maybe a good idea, you they could uh, connect with our uh, local CCB branches technical uh, department. Yeah, they are still open, yeah. Local branches sounds like a good opportunity. I'm afraid you're going to get emailed by a thousand people. We better be careful there. Um, and then uh, last but not least, uh, Jose Luis, um, you said some fascinating stuff. Uh, what if there's developers in the audience who want to get involved? What's the next step? 
Yes, it's the same. We have the, the, the our product that or our platform that is TrustOS is a, a set of APIs to easily interact with blockchain. And we are open to anybody in the world that uh, develops their own application, their own solutions on top of the TrustOS platform. So uh, in our webpage, so blockchain.telefonica.com, we have all the information regarding the technical specification of how to connect with TrustOS. And even we have some uh, startup focused programs with WIRA, that is the Telefonica Backup uh, Startup Accelerator, uh, with a lot of presence around the world also. And we have some programs in order to uh, collaborate uh, with the startup and developers to develop uh, this and, and to design these new solutions in order to get blockchain massive to, to all companies in the world. So totally Wonderful. open and it's, uh, waiting for a lot of developers uh, uh, wanting to, to use uh, TrustOS and blockchain. Wonderful. Thank you all so much. Um, before we uh, wrap things up, um, I just wanted to uh, get everybody's um, minds paying attention to this August. This August is when Forbes is going to open up the nomination process for next year's Blockchain 50 list. Um, we've got a really talented team of reporters that can um, make a lot happen without the company's help, but it's a lot easier with your help. So keep your eyes open um, when that nomination form comes out. Um, you might not know uh, who at your company is going to be filling that out. So if that's the case, fill it out yourself. Let us know what you guys are doing. Um, we need to hear from you. And our list gets stronger every year. And quite frankly, it, it, it doesn't get stronger because we get better. It gets stronger because the companies share more with us. And it just helps us tell those stories better. Um, uh, thanks to Hyperledger and, and everybody for the invitation to join. And looking forward to seeing the next panel. Oh, thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Ciao, everyone.